Okay, good morning. Sorry about the delay. We had a little technical problem which has been remediated but not resolved. Um, I think you know this is the Audit Research Seminar. We teach this every year uh, or every other year depending on what the circumstances are. And I would like to talk to you a little bit about what we are going to do here. This is a, as you know, is a PhD seminar, so it's going to be reasonably demanding for you. We are going to have classes, we are going to have an exam, and we are going to have a paper. And for the classes, you're going to have to read the articles and pre present the articles. And uh, Andrea is going to kind of allocate who does what article. And we'll be changing a little bit the syllabus over, over the semester, depending on where our research interests go in this period. Okay, in principle, this is our plan. This, uh, by the way, this is on the blackboard. Have you seen it already in blackboard? Yeah, you, if you need it, I can email you the, the syllabus. But this, it looks a little bit weird because I put it in outline mode. You all should learn how to do outline mode in Word <coughs> to make your life easier. Can, can you put your name in front of you too? Your name. Do you know what outline mode is? In Word, it has print mode, outline mode, and this is outline mode, and you use the levels. So level one is the title of the course, level two is the subheaders, level three is the date, level four, I put the topic. And so if you want to change this, you just drag it here and put it here. Very easy to do, you should do that in every paper that you are doing, if you are doing work, not doing something else. Furthermore, you should, uh, uh, you should always caption your pictures and cross-reference them. So when you add pictures, subtract pictures, you don't need to renumber them. Yes, Jamie? You learned that already, <laughs> didn't you? Okay. Uh, so I, I think at this moment, today we are going to talk a little bit about the project we are doing. Uh, uh, a couple of the projects that we are doing, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, auditing in general, and we are going to spend some time, I'm going to repeat the presentation I just did for the PCLB, and which basically talks about standards and obligation, because I didn't think you would have time to read articles in advance, etc. So we're going to get busy from next week, week on. Um, next time I'm going to talk about audit quality and PCOB inspections. Uh, the following time we are going to uh, talk about continuous auditing. And the following time Helen is going to be teaching the class uh, talking about behavior research and auditing. The following class you need to take note uh, we are going to hold it on Friday afternoon, if that's okay with you guys. If not, we'll find a date. Yes? So we have a class. You have a class. Friday. We'll find another date that we can do that. You have a class in the morning or in the, in the afternoon? In the afternoon. From what time to what time? Uh, 1.30 to 4.30. And in your class? Yeah, usually in I'll, I'll have Andrea sit down with you and find a place in the thing. That couple of times I will have to change that, change the class time. Most of them will be on Tuesdays at this time. Okay, also the other complication we have is um, next week we have a recruit on campus. So what we are going to do is stay here, have the class here. Uh, if the recruit is in, do you know if the recruit next week, Tuesday is in New Brunswick or here? I think okay. it's in New York. I thought so too. So we are going to have a class at 10, the seminar starts at 10.30, and then we come back to class. So we'll do an abbreviated class. 
That's Professor Palmo's decisions here. And if, you, if there is anything in audit that you are particularly interested and we are not covering, uh, just let me know because we can move it. Uh, and uh, if there is articles, if you are, for example, presenting here or here, and you find an article that's not in our coverage and you find it very interesting, let me know and we'll do some manipulation. Um, this is a PhD seminar, the content is variable depending on, depending on uh, what we want to do. Uh, hopefully, at least for the two of you, um, this um, uh, the seminar will help you to prepare for, a, for your summer project and do something around your summer project give you ideas for a summer project center. Now, you might think this, uh, having examined the final a little bit too much, the exam is actually designed for all of you. It's designed for preparing you to take the qualifying exam. And uh, you should have, if you take the exam and do well, you should have no problem in qualifying exam. Typically, I do write the audit exam, and you typically, people don't have problems with it, neither with that nor with the oral exam you guys have, which you don't have, okay? So it should be, shouldn't be too, too different. Uh, so let, let's do, talk a little bit about auditing. And uh, I am going to use one chart, basically, to talk about auditing, and it's kind of the part of the one what I usually do, so let's, let's see if this works okay. But first, what is the objective of audit? To make the audit report. Uh, that's a very practical objective. <laughs> what is the real objective? Uh, to verify the information that the company is trying to present. Okay, let's start with, uh, with uh, let's say, uh, agency view of audit. Principals are the owners of the business. Agents are the managers of the business. Between these and these guys, there is a thing called information asymmetry. What does information asymmetry mean? Managers know much more about the business than the owners. And this is typically true on the corporate world, when there is corporation. These are the stockholders. These are the agents, the stockholders basically know they have a stock. They don't know anything about the business. And in order to correct this particular problem of total information asymmetry, uh, management publishes <coughs> financial reports. And these financial reports are supplied to the principals to basically verify if the agents are acting properly in behalf of the principals. Is this reasonable? What is the problem that ensues? The problem that ensues is that these financial reports can be fabricated, can be not realistic. So there is the need, there is the need for some way to verify that this particular report of the firm is properly stated. Properly stated basically is, is verified by the auditors, and the auditors basically look at the financial reports and tell by issuing an opinion to the principles. Yeah. Okay, but what is the basic issue of independence? In order to, to be unbiased 
in issuing opinions, you need to be independent. The moment you are dependent, uh, there can be some problem. It doesn't mean that if you are not independent, you necessarily will be biased. But there is a higher likelihood that can be that you could be biased. What is this idea here of fairly stated? Go ahead, then. Not 100% exactly the same or applied to. So there is this thing of correctness. And most engineering measurements, most measurements are never exact. There is no such a thing as a physical measure that exact. Because you always can go to a higher degree of precision and be unexact. So, uh, so the idea is, is that working? Yes. Okay, so, okay, I don't know how to check if uh, if it's working correct. Right. You want me to speak here or it's okay to speak there? It's okay to speak there, but if you stand here, I think it will be Okay, thanks. So I'm going to try to speak, stay here when I'm not using the black. Okay. Yes, okay, that's perfect. Thank you. They're yeah, seeing the screen from my lap, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. So, the relative error is a concept of engineering. If I tell you that particular table is two meters long, you say, okay, but Ben comes in with a better measurement device and it's two meters and three centimeters. Then someone comes there and say, it's two meters, three centimeters, and seven millimeters. And you can go back to the microns. There is never an exact measure. That is, not in the physical sciences. So the question of fairly stated is an admission by auditors or by auditing standards that there is an intrinsic error in the measurement. So what is considered a materially fairly stated statement? Is there any, any quantitative guidance? Yes, no, maybe. The standards don't give you quantitative mind guidance. In general, people tend to use 5% of net income, meaning gross income minus expenses, that's net income. Typically, people use that. But if you think a company has very limited, is a year of nearly zero profits, you finish up with the infinitesimal uh, size of materiality. Therefore, that doesn't work. So they say 5% of ongoing income or average income or expected income. You try to come up with something that's a reasonable measure. Now, what are the issues with materiality? Can you raise something? Everything in accounting and in auditing has issues. So let's come up with something. If the gui guidance for the auditors, how much they put into their efforts? It, it gives you some guidance, but what are the difficulties with this? Yeah. Materiality depends on the type of company, like um, all, all kinds of different factors. Like what? Like the type of business you're engaged in. Um, and, and why does that affect error or measurement? Some things you have to make estimates. Sometimes the estimates are more difficult to do. And the more difficult the estimate is, the higher probability that those estimates are incorrect. That's line of business. Very good. What else? Uh, maybe that there is a lot of immaterial mistakes, but they may add up to a larger material mistake. OK, now you're getting deep there. Is uh, the question that I was asked, are we doing mat account materiality, or we are doing item materiality? Oh, we are doing financial statement materiality. Like what, what you just raised 
is the issue if you have a lot of little immaterial, not let's say not little, but medium immaterial errors in several accounts, and they go in the same direction, you add them together, you might have immaterial error per account and material error in the financial statement. They add up. Is that correct? She agrees with me. Do you? Really? No, I do. Yeah. Okay. And actually, I, I'll tell you a little bit of history. Uh, I can't think of this, but this was probably over 25 years ago. Uh, the AICPA at that time set standards to the United States audit. And they commissioned a study. They had a committee on materiality, and they commissioned a study by this guy, John Grant Road, University of San Francisco, who was a big expert in the area. <coughs> And it turned out that they finished up basically with the political quite by. The large firms were quite willing to do uh, quantitative guidance on materiality, but the small firms rejected it and wanted it to be judgmental. So what happened after that? Uh, they basically finished up with a standard with no quantitative guidance. So that's, uh, that was the uh, story up to today, and of course it has not been, it was politically so hot that they haven't opened the committee again, done anything like that. It has been very delicate there, and basically the PCOB that succeeded the Auditing Standards Board continues with this, uh, with this kind of undefined materiality threshold. And of course you hear a lot of discussions on that, and of course the PCOB has been looking and uh, what kind of materiality they should I accept at the moment. Okay, so let, let's go back. Uh, the other thing that people talk a lot about is skepticism. What is auditor skepticism? Selena, what is it? It's, it's like you are looking at very skeptical at this whole thing and say, what is this? Okay. Uh, it's actually the other word people use is conservatism, which is basically skepticism in one direction. Um, and uh, a lot of talks about auditors not questioning enough the results of the fund. Okay, I, was, I just came back uh, Saturday night from the media AAA audit meeting. And they had 400 people there, it was huge, okay? Uh, and I was very surprised. They had practically no articles on analytics, which is probably the biggest, obviously, bias, but it's the biggest lead of the profession at this moment is looking into, into analytics. There are actually zero articles. I couldn't find one, okay? But maybe there were a couple that I overlooked. Uh, but there was a lot of studies looking at auditor skepticism, independence, there were a lot of studies about looking at PCOB examinations. And that said, let me go back and maybe you guys don't know, uh, the US actually has two audit standard centers. For private companies is uh, the, still the AICPA and it's what they call the ASB, Auditing Standards Board of the ASB, American Institute of CPAs, Auditing Standards Board. And Sabine's office set up the Public Company Audit Oversight Board. And you might not have heard this, but there are some people rumoring here that President Trump is going to eliminate the PCOB. Okay, I don't think that's quite possible because Sardines Oxford is a law, although they, they can change the law because they, the Republicans have, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think that he has bigger fishes to fry. He's not going to spend time worrying about the PC. Uh, that's kind, kind of an interesting story. Let's, let's go back to this discussion here. So this, these are the owners. These are the managers. These guys are day-to-day, day-to-day uh, day -day running the business. 
these guys know a lot about the business, these guys know very little about the business. Uh, what is the motivation of the principal? If you own the stock of a company, what do you want, Mr. Chen? Speak a little bit louder, but yes, you want the price of the stock to go up. Maximize the value. Huh? Maximize the value. Yeah, but it's not all the price. The value is an addition of two things price <coughs> and dividends, correct? Yeah. Is a dividend for delta P. What, what does the agent want? Find its biggest duty for itself, for their own benefit. Yeah, and what are those, what are those variables? Continuously hired with big by the by So the he sale. wants job security, uh, salaries, corner officers, <laughs> cute secretaries, <laughs> uh, all the set of fringes. Now, every fringe that is a financial fringe, if, if it doesn't go to the agent, where does it go? If your salary, instead of being a million, is half a million, what happens with the other half a million? In general, who will be distributed as dividend, correct? Or at least who will be there in the wealth of the stockholders. So, uh, there is this thing that is a lot of research called moral hazard. And what is the moral hazard? The fact that the motivations of this group and these are different. And the only accountability method is the financial statement. And so there is a desire here to present something that might be different than the reality in order to achieve their own objective. If their objectives were the same, there wouldn't be this information symmetry, uh, hazard, moral hazard type of thing. Are we good with this? Okay. Now, so the parties here that we are thinking is the stockholders, the company, and the assurance. Now, we actually happen to have at least two types of assurance. Internal and external audit. So what's the difference of these things? What's the difference of the motivation? Friends here, that is, the risk is zero. What's the difference between an internal and an external auditor? What are the, the what are the differences between them? The independence from issues is more important for the external auditors because to give more authority or reliability to the principles. The objective is internal auditors, they have more plenty of time, so more focus on the compliance and on, on more broader issues. So in, in general, that's what's taught, is that internal auditors tend to, tend to emphasize controls and compliance. And external auditors uh, tend to emphasize on fair representation. Of course, these two things overlap. I very often don't like in my articles to, to say what kind of auditors they are, internal or external. And invariably, I get a referee complaining about them. The referee say, is this internal or external audit? And there are certain things that it really matters. There are other things that I'm not sure, so sure it matters. Okay, but independence. How independent are internal auditors? 
they report typically to two parties. They typically report to the CFO and they report to the board. Reporting to the board, and the board is another layer here of providing, uh, providing uh, governance. And the board typically will have independent audit committee and will probably uh, have an independent compensation committee, but not necessary. Okay, so they, these are um, these are some generic setups, and companies will go and do different things. The tendency since Abenz Oxley, even before, is to make more and more board members independent. What does it mean, independent? It means that they are not employees of the company, although they get compensation to be the board members. Now, in the past, Typically, management was part of several of these boards, including the audit committee. The CO and CFO were part of these boards. And progressively, good governments have told them to separate these guys out. Uh, I actually don't think that that's tremendous protection. There is actually another committee that exists in most boards called the nominating committee. And the nominating committee is decides who becomes a board member and decides who is in what committee. And typically those are not very independent. And so at the end, management tends to find people, either they are very famous and they have no time to do anything, or they are obedient. The word, the technical word for this is poodles. <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> Poodle like the dog, poodle. Ob obedient. Okay. No, but I'm just joking. But uh, there is a, a, I, I still think that there is a substantial uh, lack of independence in boards, even if the board members, a board member is making $150,000 to have four meetings a year. Um, that's kind of good incentive to, to be reasonably quiet. Okay, and so I, I don't think that is, uh, the boards provide a level of protection that people think that they do. Uh, I had a PhD student here, um, and she did a, I never liked dissertations about boards. And uh, she did a big study about uh, boards, board independence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and she had 20 hypotheses, and she, uh, and, and she had the alpha level of 5% supported one. So it was totally random what she found. She did get, uh, get her PhD because I thought the work was interesting, but, uh, but didn't prove anything. And, and the, reality, the reality is a lot of these boards, the, the thing that really mattered this board is what club the board members are and how they interact with management, how they were found, these kind of very difficult things to measure, uh, how these relationships have developed. And so that's why those results, there is a lot of studies on, on boards and board memberships and etc. They are all over the map. Yeah, I don't like that study a lot at all, that type of study, but that's my bias. Some people, people there are, you know, departments of management, they love that type of stuff. Okay, but the findings are not particularly strong. And an independent member, you know, what does it mean independence of, of a board member? You are being paid to be part of that board. Okay? And it's reasonably high compensation. How can you be reasonably independent? Do you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. A little bit louder. I would say not so much. Sorry? I think there's a lot of issues. With the board. I, a lot of issues, yeah. And, but uh, you know, it's the kind of thing. Uh, don't criticize something if you can't come up with something better. That's true. And it's very difficult. What do you think about the idea of the government appointing board members? <laughs> government? Yeah. 
always like that. You like that? I mean, I mean in China, always like that. In China, I know it's like that, but that's that's what I ask. The same thing. Govern the audit auditors, the external auditors are chosen by management, correct? They are not really chosen by management. They are chosen by technically by the audit committee. Uh, that provides maybe if the audit committee members were independent, that would provide some layer. Actually, there are countries where the government designate who is the external audit. And uh, it's just uh, very difficult to criticize something that you can't, don't have a better solution. And I don't think uh, Italy, for example, has government designated auditors. And I don't think the system is much better. Yeah, it's, uh, it has a whole set of other problems. Why do they pay board members so much? Not all board members are paid so much. When I was in New York Stock Exchange Company, uh, I was paid fifteen thousand dollars to be on the board. Okay, but uh, but the large companies pay a lot, and they want people with marquees. You know, Kissinger is in many boards, and you start getting these names. And and you know there was some board governance rules that said that a board member CEO from company shouldn't be in more than, I think, three other boards. But just think about it. You are running a company. Do you have time to, to be in three other boards and be on? If you are in a board, you typically want to be in the audit, have to be in the, one of the committees. You are outside member. Then you should be in the audit committee. It's, I, I don't think this provides as much as a protection as you could, but I can't come up with a better idea. So this is kind of the generic framework. We'll come back. We'll come back a little bit later and talk a bit more about this. Uh, and this, uh, just stay. I'm going to bring this outline back up a little bit later. I want to. I picked up. I picked up. Uh, I picked up uh, this thing out of Evans and Lobecki book, this old book, but it's a kind of nice process overview. It's in the cover of the book, and I usually do my own, and I decide that this time I'm going to do, uh, do it differently. So, So this is out of Aaron's, uh, uh, Aaron's book, and that's kind of the, was the top seller in, uh, in, in academic books. And he had divided this thing into four areas. Uh, phase one, plan and design and audit approach. Phase two, perform tells or control subsidy of transaction. Phase three, perform analytical procedures. Phase four, complete the audit initial audit report. That's Debate. I, go, I actually cut this in half. Just remember, this is where I'm going to cut it out so to make the picture bigger and you could see it better. Okay? All my slides, all the things I use in class, you're most welcome to have. I, I don't hide that. Okay, so can you see this better? I can lower the, the screen and you'll see. So, what is this first step? Accept client and perform initial planning. It's accept client and perform initial planning. Actually, is this where the audit starts? No. Uh, first, external auditors tend to stay long time with the clients. Okay? However, however, um, there is an initial year. And there is a process of accepting a client. Now, uh, when I started working in auditing or teaching auditing, 
uh, I was pretty much sure that if uh, a client wanted to hire you, you would take the job. But it's not like that anymore at all. Uh, when you start negotiating with the client about taking their audit, you basically investigate the client. It's a, they go to sometimes extremes of hiring uh, internal, uh, hiring external investigators and looking at the background of the of management and etc. Why why is that? To measuring the risk of the company or client. That's right. They are trying to assess what the risk is. Uh, there is some. There have been several literature pieces saying that for a crooked management, there is no audit that can detect, really. And it, so therefore, what you try to avoid is manage, management that are crooked. Okay, so what do you do is when you are, and the other thing is that certain industries have much higher risk than the other industries. Now, there is the other angle of this is, how do you make money in auditing and how do you lose a lot of money in auditing? You don't get money about issuing correct opinion. You make money about issuing opinions. We hope that they are correct. Well, that's how you lose money. You Fairly stated, money. not correct. But well, no, no, your opinion about the financial statements has to be correct, right? I mean, that it is fairly stated. That you make money by performing the work, and you are supposed to have it fairly stated, okay? But where do you lose money? Yes, that's where you lose money, litigation. And when do you litigate? As Jamie said, the opinions find out more. But that's not the initial finding. The reason you litigate, more than half of the litigations are at bankruptcy. Okay? And why do the auditors get sued at bankruptcy? Because their opinions were wrong? Not really, because they have deep pockets. And the bankruptcy, the company is in bad shape. Uh, so the company is not going to pay anything. Where are you going to go to find your losses? You're going to go to who has deep pockets, where these pockets are audited. By the way, the incidence of litigation in auditing has gone down substantially. And there is plenty of studies talking about why and, and et cetera, et cetera. There is less litigation today than there was before. What are the factors that reduce re litigation today? To rejecting the yeah, but high risk. But yeah, that's one thing. Rejecting high risk, that was the first one I was going to say. Rejecting high risk clients. What is the other factor that uh, reduces litigation? Huh? Yeah. I think that's correct. I think since Harbane's Oxley, Oxley with the PCOB in place uh, has reduced the ability to, to litigate. There is a lot of uh, inspection of audits. Uh, there is a whole method. Actually, I think if you look at the literature of, uh, of uh, auditor inspections, PCOB inspections, um, I don't think you can argue very much with the fact that inspections improve compliance to the law, to the laws. I think the inspect there is no question that inspections improve compliance. The problem is that the standards are not very good, so complying with them sometimes makes things worse, not bad. I shouldn't say this being paid, but I said it. So that that's the problem, and uh, you're going to hear what I say about these things. And uh, so what it is, is compliance with, uh, with auditing standards that are obsolete uh, doesn't necessarily improve quote unquote audit quality. 
just improves compliance. Now, if the rules are very good, enforcing them is very good. Is that obvious or is not obvious? I think it's obvious, but <laughs> not everyone thinks it's obvious. Um, now, th that's what, um, you know, when you talk to auditors, uh, they say all this procedural stuff is not that important, you must. The most important thing is understand the client's business and understand. By understanding the client's business industry, and what does it mean understanding the client's business and industry? To find out which account is more risky in the specific client. Okay, you're already giving me a technicality. <laughs> tell me, tell me in general. No, no, you're right. But, but what it understands? Why? What does it mean understanding the client's risks and business? Sort of like what type of risks are industry standard, but also within the industry, where does your client sit? Are they more risky than other people in the industry, or do they take Okay, I think that's a little bit more general. Uh, understand also the hanky-panky that typically people will do in certain businesses, or the things that can be done. And what are the, the points that are very difficult to detect, what not. That's what they, they basically say. Understanding the business is very important. Um, We'll, we'll talk a lot about understanding. Uh, and what's the difference between understanding the client's business and industry to accessing, assessing client business risk? Now you're focusing down on the business risk from the generic. Uh, and what are these ideas of preliminary, preliminary analytical procedures? Now you can be technical, Ben. To find out some trends. So who is doing a study like this here at the car lab? You know. Keshin, Xuan, and Yunsen. Correct? They are, they are doing a new form of risk assessment using ratios traditionally. Haven't you seen the study? No. Yeah, it's for, uh, it, it's nice. It's nice what they are doing. Uh, you know what typically happens in an external engagement, external audit engagement? at this stage is that they call it uh, a brainstorm. And a brainstorm is uh, partner and manager sit down and talk about what are the risks that they are seeing this year. And uh, remember, there is an initial audit engagement when you just start with that client, and then there is a repeated audit engagement, which is most of the engagements. And so basically the partner and the manager come together and start talking about what's going on with the firm and what's different from last year. You know the story, how does the auditor cross the street? He looks at his last year's work papers and then cross the street. Bad joke, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, actually that's what they do. They sit down and say what changed from last year. In the first year, of course, they, they, they said, oh, I had another client that was in this industry, these were the circumstances, etc." And at that stage, they performed this ratio analysis. What's wrong with ratio analysis? What's good about ratio analysis? The stage is efficient, right? It's efficient. Basically, you're going to divide numbers on a known financial statement, which basically is proclaimed by management, and compare it with some standard you have. Remember, you're not allowed to use your other client's numbers for this particular audit. But you are allowed to use your experience. So if you remember the ratios, 
from another client on your memory, or you took it notes but you didn't show it to anyone, then you can do some comparison. But it's a rule 301, which is, a, uh, I think, is a very bad thing for auditing. Rule 301 basically says that you can't use data given to you for an audit to benefit another audit. And if you looked at the paper by Cheng and Professor Kogan, they are, what they are trying to do is create an anonymization procedure to basically change, to basically allow this comparison in an anonymous manner. Uh, however, they would have to get the ASB and the PCOB to agree with that, to, that kind of thing. And basically, rule 201, which is ASB. Yes. If there's like a like an anonymity type situation that exists already, like auditors can share audit information outside that engagement, uh, then if it's only being used by the audit and the auditor, why does it matter? Like, the I would assume companies don't want this to happen because they would say that there's proprietary information that could be gained from using these ratios. But if the auditor is the only one seeing the ratios and they're already seeing it. Why would they put this provision in, in the first place? I think the, the reason they put it in exactly for the reason you said is that uh, it's proprietary information. They don't want to help their competitors. Typically, the ratios of one industry are not very good for another industry. Okay? And I think the, that's the reason why they don't allow it. But I think your argument is what I would use. I, I actually think this is a bad rule and needs to be changed. Uh, can you think of any other research study we have here? I think I'm going to start inviting these guys to come and present. Um, Helen, Professor Brown, with Andrea Rosario, um, and before Abdullah, but Abdullah is gone, uh, did, uh, we did this thing called the verbal protocol analysis. Have you ever heard of VPAs? We actually going to cover Biggs and Mark, one of the papers. Verbal protocol analysis. This comes from Simon and Newell, and these were uh, famous old men. Simon is only, a, uh, I guess, not an accountant that got the Nobel Prize. And uh, Herb Simon was Professor Carnegie and did the science of artificial Simon and Ewell and etc. And basically he said, you know, you can't really put probes on people's brains and see what they are thinking. So develop a methodology called verbal protocol analysis. And what is verbal protocol analysis? It is a methodology whereby you train your subject, which is uh, in this case uh, the partner to think aloud means when they are thinking, keep talking. And basically, the experimenter stays over there. And when they stop talking, you say, talk. And so that was a big mark. I actually remember very nitidly Mark, Stan Mark. Stan Mark was my dissertation advisor at, U at, US, at UCLA. And Stan Mark was discussing his paper with Nick Dopich, the editor of JAR, General Accounting Research. And they were literally yelling at each other. Okay? And Ted would say, and uh, Nick would say, you have four subjects. How can you write a paper, an empirical paper? And he said, no, I have 10,000 interactions. That's my example, not the four subjects. Okay? And to Nick's credit, he published a paper. After they yelled at each other for a while, I was PhD student, I was very quiet on that discussion. Okay? And I remained quiet for a long time. Nick finished up publishing three of my papers, so I was very wise not opening my mouth. Uh, but uh, to his credit, and it's an interesting methodology, but has this very, obs uh, very obstructive thing of having an experimenter there speak, speak. Okay, and the other thing is what people think and what people are finish up saying, there is no way to prove this, are not the same thing. So what we actually did on, on the study, the VPA study with Helen, is we got five partners of a senior CP, 
of uh, Big Four are doing the brainstorming study at this stage here. And what we did is we put the manager in the process and say this is a new manager in your engagement. He needs to plan it with you. So the manager prepared in advance a series of questions. And what we wanted to know is how this firm in general does the brainstorming. And so uh, they actually went to this thing and uh, we tape recorded it. And so there was no talk, talk, talk because they talked plenty among themselves. There was no, no problem there. And there was a manager there saying, this is done, let's go and talk about the next thing. And this were like two hour meetings. And then Abdullah actually, uh, we used, uh, we used uh, text -to -speech a text-to-speech software, speech-to-text software, speech recognition software, Dragon. And we actually extracted it and created utterances uh, created what people said and hand edited it. Andrea did a lot of hand editing on it. And then we classified those utterances, go and get data, make a decision, do this, do that. And there are, I think there are 14 classes there that you do. And so this was, this is a study going on at this particular moment. Helen is still working on that. If Andrea's eyes are blurry, it's because there was so much data manipulation on this thing. Actually, you guys escaped it because last year we made the people in this class do some of it. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's such an interesting technique. Um, and what we are doing now is we are writing a paper on VPA and at the same time, Chow, who just walked in, so you all know Chow, uh, Chow is actually doing the first chap first essay on her dissertation is a decision support system for the for the brainstorming part of the risk assessment. And obviously the firm is very interested on that. See if you can with the decision support system uh, do better than you would do without the decision support system. Which I'm pretty sure we can, but we haven't proved it yet. Uh, so you do this analytical procedures, find areas of risk out of the brainstorm. Out of the brainstorm, you kind of understand what areas are more, uh, more critical. For example, one of the engagements that they were talking about was a retailer, and uh, they have been on the engagement for many years. And uh, they started talking about the retailer going international and say this is a whole new thing, we have never looked at this, we think this is a risk. And so that's an example, and I can, could come up with other examples. But So this is the scenario, the audit is going on year after year, and this year there is something different. Or this year the economics are very bad, or this year the client has been begin losing money, or there is one situation they bought a brand, Okay, at the brand they are losing a lot of money in the brand. They had a chain of restaurants, then they bought another chain of restaurants, they were losing a lot of money on the new chain of restaurants. So these are the kind of things that they discuss, discuss there. Okay, and now here is set materiality and accept, acceptable audit risk and inherent risk. What is this idea of inherent risk? It's just the basic risk that exists to do anything. I think people sometimes call it non-diversifiable risk. Okay, it's a risk within that it is inherent, that is basic to that particular line of business or that particular situation. Okay, but it's, there are many definitions for it. And what is this idea of audit risk? It's based, if in that particular industry, this is the risk, what level of risk I'm willing to take as an audit depending on the, if the level of risk is very high, your samples, your examination will be small. Okay, if you're, if it's very tight, you're going to have to do much more examination. Okay, now I'm going to detour from this and talk a little bit, uh, talk about a little bit about uh, some issues, issues about, about uh, risk and about thinking about the business and etc. Uh, is, 
difficult to think about auditing without thinking about what they talk, auditor judgment. And when you think about auditor judgment, you think about that final moment that the auditor sits down and say, I'm going to give a clean opinion. And most opinions are clean. So, and have you ever seen an adverse opinion in your life? Only in a textbook. Okay, they never give adverse opinions. What do, if the auditor finds a situation, he has to give an adverse opinion, what does he do? He or she, sorry. He withdraws, he posts. Okay, because if he gives a lot of negative opinion, I'm going to hire him, correct? Uh, and there are other reasons to litigation, defense, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, so there is this audit judgment, but that's not the judgment people are talking about. Because you know, in every single instance, you have to decide, is this evidence enough to tell me that the controls are good? Is this evidence enough to tell me that the cash is well counted? Is this evidence enough? So it's this whole set of things that auditors do. Now, I could tell you a, a little old story, but it comes from last week. Last week I was on the phone uh, with Trevor. Uh, Trevor is a retired partner from uh, Deloitte who works with us uh, a lot. And a guy called John Fogarty, who is, uh, was our technical leader in, in Deloitte. And they were telling us about a study that they did called the Beeper study. Like beep, beep, beeper. Okay, and the beeper study was the following. They chose every month a set of their auditors and gave them a beeper. And every time the thing beeped, they had to put in a sheet of paper what they were doing. Okay, and what they finished up it with, with uh, two large sheets of paper with classification of tasks in the audit and how many times it counted. Then the next thing they did, they did an error study. They see what kind of errors they found in an engagement. And then they try to link what you do in the audit with what kind of errors that they found. And uh, what John said that, uh, is that they couldn't link very well. But they said that many of the procedures really never found any errors. Now, of course, that could have double meaning. One meaning is they didn't find any errors because people knew they were going to do those procedures and were very careful. And if the procedures were not performed, the people would relax on those things. Or it could be that the procedures are not adequate to find errors. And then he raised another interesting thing, said is maybe this is, cannot work very well because we can't really define errors very well. Because there are these errors that at the end <coughs> you have to restate that they were fraudulent or they were incorrect. You have to restate the whole statement is the big, big, well-known error. However, however, there are many, many situations where you go to the client and say, this doesn't agree with, with what I have here. And then the client will do, do an adjustment. Correct? You've done that, haven't you? <coughs> <coughs> and so it's difficult to figure out exactly what the error. So I was talking to, we were talking to John and he said, we should do this study again. Now we are not going to use a beeper. We probably are going to use a cell phone. Okay? And one thing that I would like to do this is have an undercarriage on the computer systems that would capture what screen they were looking at each time and think ab about some other things. And I haven't convinced them that they need to do this, but they seem to be interested. What I want to do is, I wrote this in JTA paper, last JTA paper that I published um, with uh, Hussein, uh, is that I would like to pick up the whole audit engagement and break it down into two categories. One category, things that are procedural and you do you have to collect data, put evidence together, do this, do that. That you can do a classic 
time and motion study. And you know what Henry Ford did for the Ford Model T? The Ford Model T was the first big mass production car, and you could have it any color you wanted, but as far as it was black. They only had black Ford Model T. Okay, and what he did, he developed this whole technique of you don't go and get the tool, the tool is in your belt. Okay, you don't go and get the part, the part comes to you. You don't keep a big inventory of parts, the parts come while the cars are being manufactured. So we basically were minimizing the time and motion of the production. And I bet you that in auditing, there is a lot of things, I bet you the Beeper study even showed that that you do just for doing it. It's traditional to do, it's written on a standard, whatever. And then there's this other part of the audit, they're they not necessarily separate. It's probably a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. That you have to make judgments. And then on the judgments, I want to come up with the taxonomy of judgments. The kind of judgment that you have to do for an audit. And some of them are going to be very complex, evidentially, judgments. Some other ones are going to be very simple. And then the next question of those judgments is which one of those judgments can be automated? Which one cannot? And which ones can be automated to a certain degree using artificial intelligence? Is this interesting? You guys look too sleepy. You guys need a break sometime? So we can go on. Can go on? Okay. Um, and so this is the idea of setting up the risk that you are willing to bear. Um, and then here he puts this little thing about fraud risk. The standards don't work on this sequence, but they say that it needs to be done. And then you develop an overall strategy. So this whole thing was planning the audit. Who does this? Typically, manager of an engagement uh, in consultation to a partner. Okay, now here is the kind of more industrial engineering type work of it. Okay, <coughs> you look at control testing. What is this idea of control testing? <coughs> if, so there's controls in place, for example, if there's a purchase order, someone needs to sign off and a separate person needs to pay out the order. So you want to look through and see, if, are two separate people performing these tasks, or is it the same person? And are these controls actually in place in the first place? Okay. Okay, so what, what is a control? To minimize the, the things going wrong, and to make the procedures. His methodology is to decrease the amount of va variations from uh, the set of how things should be done. Okay, most controls in the past were manual. All controls are past manual. Uh, today, a lot of the controls are built in into the company's ERP. And a test of control, and what, what is the basics of control? If the controls are very good, you don't need to do a lot of detailed testing. If the controls are bad, you need to do a lot of control testing. Now, it's very difficult to say controls are good or bad. Certain areas of controls are more effective or not. In ERPs, um, there is two types of variation from controls. One type of thing is a, is a definite management override. For example, a bank gives credit limits to everyone, okay, in credit cards. And then a bank, a bank manager or someone in credit might have the authority to say, increase the credit line or allow this particular charge to happen. So one of them is that the system itself doesn't detect a certain error. The other thing is a management override. 
And both of those are interesting in examination. So you do this whole type of discussion on controls, and then you test transactions. Again, very simple to think about this. You think about if you find that you can rely on certain set of controls, you can reduce the sample that you take. And you're going to hear me talk about samples a lot, so uh, so don't don't stop here. Uh, now. Another thing now, the overall thing about research. The audit model has developed over 100 years. Okay, the, the Security Act of 33-34 prescribed companies that had to have audits if they were public listed, regardless of some ex little exceptions that they have. Okay, so since 33-34, you're performing audits, actually even before that because there were companies that opted to be audited before the Security Act. Now, you have this whole thing about companies where we quite are required to be audited. And you developed a methodology for auditing. But something happened in the middle. What happened in the middle? Somewhere in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, instead of hand records, people started having computer records. Did that change everything? She's saying yes. She's going. You go to some auditors today, they say, no, it's the same thing, just with the computer. But it does change everything. And you'll, you'll hear plenty of examples of what things changed. But so we had this thing. Now, in 2006, Sabes Oxley rule came out. It was a whole set of new auditing rules. But the most important of them is that the auditor, in addition to giving an opinion of the company, inside of the opinion had to make an assertion on the controls of the company. And auditors all along, or since uh, the early days, we're doing this as access, accessing controls. But now they have to issue an opinion on the controls. And research has been done on that. Issuing an opinion on control might sound same thing, but it's not. Now you are, you are making explicit assumption. In general, in the past, you, you put the controls together with the test you did and give an opinion. Now you have to tell the controls and then the opinion. And you know, every time there is one dramatic rule like this, a lot of papers are written about it. And there are plenty of papers being written about, uh, about issue opinion control, what happened with uh, variations on the clean opinion controls, and et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty of research being done on that. But what I always say, and I have been saying, I'm sure you heard it last year, is that we know very little about auditing, assuring controls, we know a lot about the traditional audit, and we need to do much more research on controls. Um, and then, again, you test the controls. If the controls are weak, you do a larger sample. If your controls are strong, you do a smaller sample. And then you make some kind of estimate of the potential of misstatement of financial statements. Okay, and this is the stage three and four. Uh, and depending on what you thought was the level of uh, of control, you could be low, medium, and high. Then you go to the next kind of thing, perform the pursuit, perform test of key, key items, perform additional tests, detail of balances. And finally, this is the evaluative part of the audit. Now, every textbook has something like this. But things are not done in this type of sequence. You are progressively forming judgments on the parts of the audit that you examine. Uh, meaning, if you were a recently minted uh, accounting student, and you go on a, 
you go on a job, uh, you, you get an accounting job, you would like to go on a big firm or a small firm that you are auditing. You want to audit AT&T or you want to, to audit mom and pop department? Everyone wants a prestigious big audit, correct? But thinking about it, my wife was a Cooper's Leiber, and she spent the entire year on the receivables of a large firm. Okay, so you only see one little piece of the whole story. If you are auditing as small or small to medium enterprise, you see every aspect of the business. Also, would you like to go with uh, one of the big four, or would you like to go with a medium size or small size? public account. Hmm? Why? Yeah, I can earn more and with a high platform. You make more money and supposedly you're going to learn here that audit quality is better than the big firms. <coughs> there is a big advantage of going to small firms, yeah. which is with a small firm, which is you get to see complete engagements. You get to learn from other parties. More it's more fun, I guess, if you can call it fun. Okay. Um, and so this is kind of the concluding part of the audit. Uh, what I thought I would do after this, and I'm kind of running out of time, so I, I want to accelerate a little bit. I, I wanted to show you uh, the presentation I made for the PCOB uh, in December. And this was basically, I think Ben, you two saw it, correct? The, the clock is one hour ahead. Yes. 11.28, so I have an hour and 20 minutes, correct? An hour and 10 minutes. Uh, so I, these two guys saw it, but I, I think it's worthwhile hearing it a little bit because uh, I now have comments about what they told me. Okay, so this was uh, the PCOB Institute. And first when they called me to do this, I was all excited, I thought, uh, I'm talking to the PCOB, great, I can talk about audit analytics, tell them to, to do more audit analytics. Then I discovered that this was not, that this was not talking to the PCOB, this was talking to the PCOB Institute, which is basically a conference they do once a year. And this was a big one because it was number 10. So it was the 10th. But I said, oh, this is a waste of time, but I already had said that I was going to do it, so I did it. And then I saw who is going to come to this conference, and I got excited again, because there 38 countries were represented, Korea was represented. Um, China was represented, uh, and uh, uh, 38 countries. And the other thing I discovered is that all the board members were going to be there. So I got to actually powwow with some board members and talk to them. It was very interesting. Uh, so I'm not sure if it was, I, I think it was good, it was, was worth it. I also had the chance to spend some time talking to the chief auditor of the PCOB and three guys that were their reports. 